Welcome to everybody here in Charles Street at the Legatum Institute and to uh, audiences in the United Kingdom and around the world joining us uh, live through live streaming. My name is Jeff Gedman. I'm president and CEO of the Legatum Institute. Today is the launch, the release of our signature publication, the Prosperity Index. And now we have an opportunity to dive in with a very distinguished panel, uh, all of whom will give introductory statements, but I think the main uh, the main game is to get them to interact, discuss, maybe even argue a little bit, and then open it up to you uh, in uh, short order. Um, let me give introductions first, then I'll call one of our panelists to lead off, and then we'll get right into things. To my immediate left is Brendan Burchell. He is the uh, head of the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. He's a distinguished researcher. Um, very prolific writer. He's interested in a range of issues having to do with well-being, the effect of labor markets, psychological dimensions, and so forth. So first, Brendan, welcome, and join me in welcoming Brendan today. <laughs> Thank you for being here. To my right is Jules Evans. Jules is the policy director for the Center for the Study of the Emotions at Queen Mary University of London. He writes prolifically. He does a lot of television and radio. He's also the author of a recently published book titled Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations, a fabulous title, which has been published around the world in at least 19 different languages. Please welcome Jules. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs> and then next to my far left, Dr. Len Shackleton. Uh, Len is a professor of economics at the University of Buckingham. Uh, he's been previously dean of Royal Docks Business School at the University of East London. He, too, like the other colleagues, is a frequent commentator on radio, television, a prolific author. Welcome, Len, very much. Glad you're here today. <laughs> and then finally, in this empty chair to my right, will be momentarily <laughs> Gus O'Donnell, Lord O'Donnell, who, as you well know, has served uh, as cabinet minister to three prime ministers, uh, he's a distinguished commentator on a variety of economic and political issues. He's also chairman of the Legatum Institute Wellbeing Commission. Hold your applause until Gus actually sits in that <laughs> chair, which will probably be in the next five to ten minutes. But if I may, um, this panel is uh, dealing specifically with the question, does economic growth improve people's well-being? You'll be happy to know that we're not posing that as a yes or no answer but we're really asking a very distinguished panel to help us start thinking about it, framing it, and figuring out exactly what the right questions to pose are. So if I may, and if I, if I could encourage my, my fellow panelists up here uh, to be um, rich in comment but relatively brief so <laughs> that you all can interact and take questions from the audience. If I may, Brendan, could you lead us off and just tell us um, with such a question um, where do we start? What are the principal things we should think, be thinking about? How do we frame this conversation? It's, it's a very difficult conversation to frame. Um, and I think it does take enormous clarity of thought, which doesn't come easily. This is a very difficult sort of thing to think about. And I've um, struggled a lot with, with many of these questions. But I, let me see if I can take us a little way forward. Nathan was useful in, in separating out the, the economic from the well-being and satisfaction. But I think it's very important to go beyond that and separate out that well-being and satisfaction. There are measures there in among these hugely complex and numerous measures you've got, some of which are about how satisfied we are with our lives and with our education systems and so on. And some of them are to do with the quality of life we've got. In a way, we measure them objectively. As we said, very importantly, we're seeing these uh, measures of infant mortality, life expectancy, and, and health, and so on. And they're very different things. Although we see them maybe in, in terms of this red and blue blended into purple model, I think those two things, the satisfaction and the quality of life, ones that we need to really need to pick those apart. And this allows us to do this. We have got this amazing data source, and, and it does a much better job than many others. And if we look at 
one of this sort of lead tables, the, the Human Development Index, I think that's been great, not only in, as another example of being going for a lot longer since the late 90s in measuring these things, but also in driving them. I think it's because we've got indices like that and like this one that we have seen improvements. We have been able to focus on and ask ourselves those questions, exactly what are the, the drivers of these things. What we want to do, I think, is not just make people satisfied, because as we get economic improvements, quite rightly, people get more demanding in what they want from their lives, what they want from their governments, what they want from an education system. So you get this paradox that as, as we get very clear economic development, in terms of those satisfaction scores, it's almost part of being human that we want to push forward. That spirit of entrepreneurship that we see again, incorporated very well in, in this index is that we want these things. Our expectations rise along with economic growth. And so instead of focusing just on those, I'm not saying they're unimportant, those measures of satisfaction and, and happiness and so on, but we want to, to really look at the quality of life. And we've got lots of those sorts of things. We've got health. Um, we've got whether people are employed, for instance. And we know, you know having a job is so important to people's well-being. People who want to work and can't find employment or self-employment have some of the worst well-being across all countries that we've studied these things in. Um, what we're often not sure about is how we drive these things forward. What is it that it really does is the main driver of, say, that, that fantastic drop in infant mortality that we've seen over this five-year period. One of the things that I think has helped these things drop is by having these measures, is being able to look at the countries that are more successful and less successful, and a bit of name and shame as well through these league tables. That's what we should be aiming to drive forward. And think, in that 89 measures, and we'll come on to it, and I know it's always a bit harsh, whenever you do something like this, somebody's going to say, but you didn't measure this or you didn't measure that. I think there are important measures of quality, particularly, and of course I would say this, I'm interested in people's working lives, but not only that people have jobs, but have good jobs, or in their entrepreneurship. If we see that as so crucial to driving all this, entrepreneurship, allowing people to work in a prosperous, profitable way, not only that they can do that, but they can do that in hours that allow them to be good family members, good parents, and good citizens as well, to do that in an environment free from discrimination and uh, and, and in, in, in safety and using their skills that they've learned through their education and so on. I think, uh, sorry, I'm going on now, and I, we, I know you asked good, me to be good, brief. And, uh, so that's where I think we should, we should be focusing on, separating out the satisfaction from the quality of life. Then we can see and get an understanding of how these things go forward. But in a word, if we're just trying to drive up satisfaction, we're always going to be frustrated. That's the very nature of, it, of what it is to be human. Uh, Brendan, thank you. And uh, we're going to get to Jules for his introductory comment in just a second, but I'm going to take the liberty of asking a question. Tell us, step back for a moment, if you would, and tell us a little bit about the trend in industry now that tries to measure these things. Um, why is <coughs> the, the attempt to measure these things important? And in your view, what, what would you say are the opportunities, but perhaps also the limits of how you measure such things? Sorry, when you say you, we're talking about employment well -being. now. Well, well, well being well -being. broadly, and then specifically some of the things you raised. It's, it's one of the, there are so many, like I said, there are, it, these things are, when you first try to do it and you see how many ways there are to go wrong, and you, one conclusion you could draw, and it'd be very sad if people did draw this, would be to say there are so many things that go wrong we shouldn't even try. And there will always be people who criticize these sorts of indices from their armchairs and, and, and point out problems. In there. If we do think, it's important to think, I'd like to say, things that we really could say, like lowering infant mortality, like having well functioning <coughs> labour markets, are things that we could unambiguously say, this is what we want to have going forward. But also, what we don't want to do, and this has maybe been the blight of much of our education system and health system within the UK, if you create artificial indices, then people might think of ways of getting around them by changing the way that they, they measure their chasing targets and so on. So, but I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I think it does require a lot of careful thought. You get the data, you look at it, you analyze it, and, and you continue to improve year on year. Thank you.
Jules, over to you, and, and you're free to say what you want in your introductory statement, but I wouldn't mind at all if you could take up as part of that this question. Um, as one of our colleagues asked uh, from the audience in our uh, introduction by Nathan, um, what are the principal drivers of prosperity? And we have this index that has these eight subcategories of education and social <coughs> capital and governance and economy and entrepreneurship and opportunity. And on the one hand, we do seek to measure these things, and we do believe that there are principles and guidelines. At the mm -hmm. same time, and I ask you this as an international best-selling emphasis, international <laughs> best-selling author, um, development is not an engineering problem either. And if, if it were, we would have worldwide perfect peace and prosperity because we would have the formula and we would simply uh, transpose it or impose it or you know, insist or encourage that it be adopted and then presto, we'd have it. So how do you get the balance right between identifying the drivers and the guidelines and the hints and tips and clues, but also understanding that each nation is unique mm -hmm. or may be in its own stage of development at a given time? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, that's a big question. Um, so um, I've watched the rise of this new phenomenon over the last few years, um, which um, I and others have called the politics of well-being. I had a blog that was called that for, for many years, which is basically governments thinking that they can and should try to encourage the growth of well-being in their citizens, um, which as a philosopher it interests me because it's the revival of a very old idea. You come across in Aristotle, the idea that governments should encourage eudaimonia or flourishing in their citizens can and should. So there's been a revival of this just in the last kind of decade or so with people, economists particularly, thinking that we can now uh, define and measure eudaimonia. In fact, the Office of National Statistics now tries to mm. measure our eudaimonia in this country. But as a philosopher, I would say I'm sympathetically sceptical about some of the aspects of this politics of well-being. Um, can we definitely objectively define and measure flourishing? I think there's a risk sometimes that we import hidden value assumptions into these supposedly objective scientific measurements. Um, so if we look at just you know, the, the prosperity index, which I really applaud and think that a lot of work has gone into it, it's an impressive piece of work. But there are still kind of some assumptions, of course, in the model. For example, when you measure social capital, I saw that one of the things you're measuring there is, is marriage rates. So there's an assumption there that if, if less people are getting married, there's less social capital, which might be true, but we can't necessarily assume that. We could also ask what's left out of it. I mean, obviously, the big thing that's left out of your model of prosperity is um, the environment, environmental conditions, despite the, uh, the logo. And culture as well. I mean, we used to think for thousands of years that you measure the prosperity of a society by its arts, by its monuments of beauty. But of course, beauty and the arts are quite hard to measure empirically. So there's a risk that that just gets left out as we become more and more quantitative in our approach to the good life. So nonetheless, I'm sympathetic to the, the general attempt to try and look beyond GDP, to find broader and better definitions of flourishing. But I'm still a little suspicious of how sensitive these national well-being measurements are, which I know is only a component of the prosperity index, but I'll just focus on that. For example, I'd love to ask Gus O'Donnell when he arrives, who's a big advocate of these kind of <coughs> national well-being measurements, could he tell me about a single policy which a government's introduced which has made an obvious rise in national well-being measurements? I'm not aware of one. For example, in this country in the last five years, we introduced a huge, we put a huge amount of money into talking therapies. We've created a national mental health service, but, um, which I'm a big supporter of, but we haven't seen any real impact on these big national well-being levels because I'm just not sure it's a very sensitive um, measurement. So just wrapping up, uh, at the local level, I think maybe these kind of well-being measurements are more useful, not so much the national level, where I think it's so aggregated it doesn't necessarily tell us anything useful, but more at the local level. So for example, recently I saw um, New Economics Foundation measured the well-being impact of some um, local community projects, which the big lottery fund had put some money into. And it found that these local community projects helped to raise individuals' well-beings by about 30% or so. But even at that local level, it was still quite broad and hard to tell what exactly in these community projects was lifting people's moods. But let's just assume that talking about what are the drivers for prosperity, what are the drivers <coughs> for well-being? I would say um, two things. First of all, participation. It seems that social capital, participating in groups with other people, improves our well-being. And the other thing is um, wisdom, learning ideas or tools that we can use to manage our own lives.
So, you know, I think that's something that governments at the national and the local level can look to encourage, helping people to participate in community groups, whether that's religious groups, arts groups, or civic groups. Um, the problem of that, of course, is the paradox which the, the coalition has found, the paradox of how does government right up there encourage the growth of small groups down there. Adult education and community groups is something that is hard to encourage by big national policies. It's something we all have to do to some extent for ourselves. On that very point, Jules, um, for the role of government, does government have a responsibility to promote that sort of thing? Um, where it does, um, what's productive and what is unproductive? And finally, is there a role for government in some of those instances to intelligently stand out of the way? Mm. Well, yeah, I think you're, you're touching on a question of, um, is it appropriate for governments to push forward one particular model of well-being? I think for decades the idea was that governments can just support the material elements of our life, but leave us to pursue our own good in our own way. The government shouldn't tell us how to live the good life. They should leave us to find our own model. Um, I think governments can do a certain amount, as long as they try to do it in a pluralistic way, without saying this is the only model of well-being you should follow. For example, it can put a lot more into adult education, creating places where people can learn, participate, acquire new skills, you know, learn how to play a musical instrument, and kind of you know, make up their own minds, develop their own thinking skills. So, I mean, at the moment, for example, um, adult education is, is completely off the map. Uh, in, in policy terms. I mean, our governments very blithely close half the libraries in the country or so. No one thinks about, you know, the benefits of, of, of these kind of things. So that's one thing governments could do, is actually put a lot more resources into that kind of thing. Thank you. Well, Len, you're in a lovely position because now we have <laughs> most of it all out there, right? We have life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We have the role of government, uh, the role of the citizen. Uh, and does economic growth matter for well-being? So pick up what you like and take us away. Okay, well first, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I, I must say that the, the uh, reading through the, the, the brochure, uh, as I was able to do in, uh, online the other day, it's a fascinating piece of work. And it's a great addition, really, to, to the uh, range of indexes, which we already have, of course. Uh, but it's, it's got a, a lot of new material in it. So I'm very pleased to see that. I'm also very pleased to see the headline story, which is that the world does appear to be becoming more prosperous. I think we hear a lot of doom and gloom, and it's very good to hear uh, you know, the counter view that actually things are getting better on average, not for everybody, but on average, things are getting better year on year. That's terrific. Now, uh, when I was asked to do this, um, th there are a number of questions posed which I might like to think about. The first of this, and that's just been alluded to, is, uh, is to do with um, have governments sort of overemphasized economic growth at the expense of all these other things? Well, of course, the answer may vary from country to country, but I remain to be convinced on this because a lot of the measures which governments take um, have almost certainly reduced economic growth, whether deliberately or, or, or not. Uh, I'm thinking of things like excessive regulation of labor and product markets, restrictions on trade and immigration, high levels, inappropriate structures of tax, benefit systems which, uh, which uh, lock people into dependency, climate change policies which are unlikely to achieve anything apart from putting up our energy bills. All sorts of things like this haven't actually promoted the cause of economic growth. So the view that governments are overemphasizing economic growth is not one I'm immediately taken with. The question which you just posed was about um, whether um, growth translates into improvements in well-being. Well, uh, not always, of course, but I have to think that the high rates of growth in countries like China and other parts of, of East Asia and so on have lifted more people out of poverty than governments have managed to do in a comparable period of time. And to turn the question around, is there any evidence at all that slower or even negative economic growth will actually boost well-being. Well, we've just had a, a five-year experiment of this in the UK and in, in many other countries. And I think the answer is people are not very happy with situations of zero or negative economic growth. Then there's the question of should governments have a role in, in trying to promote well-being? Well, of course, this sounds like 
you know, motherhood and apple pie, yeah, fantastic, governments should do these things. But what can governments actually do? If you look at the research which has been done on this, a lot of people draw attention to the fact that increases in living in, in GDP per head don't translate into higher well-being. Of course they don't. But uh, nor does anything else you can put your finger on. Uh, high levels of public spending don't boost it. Um, the degree of equality or inequality in society don't boost it. Shorter hours of work don't boost it. It's very difficult to put your finger on policies which governments can undertake, which will actually boost these kind of indicators. I would think that a lot of the work which has been done on well-being is not about macro stuff at all. It's about micro stuff, and particularly about individuals and how people's happiness is affected by things which governments can't really do very much about. I think, you know, Jules, you mentioned a moment ago uh, the idea that, that uh, people being married or partnered actually increases their, their well-being. I think this is a very well-established result in the literature. What you do about this, I'm not sure. Uh, recently, the Sultan of Brunei, who is not in this list of tables, I, I was sorry to see, the Sultan of Brunei has been taken with the question of marital instability, and he's introduced Sharia law, and uh, this involves a hundred lashes for adultery. Now, that should do something, I guess, to, to boost the mar uh, you know, marriage and all that kind of stuff, but I'm not sure we want to go down that direction. Uh, <laughs> Um, another thing which affects uh, well-being is known to be age, for example, with older people generally being happier. There are some variations on the way. And this must, it means we must be very careful of interpreting well-being statistics. You mentioned localism, and I think it's very interesting because uh, a year or so ago, um, I was on BBC Radio Wales to discuss the uh, first um, uh, publication by the Office of National Statistics on their uh, responses to the question, overall, how happy did you feel yesterday? And I, I was asked to take part in a discussion of this, which very rapidly degenerated, because the first thing the presenter drew out of this was that people in Anglesey were a lot happier than people in Swansea. Mm. And this led to phone-in, you know, people ringing up, indignant that Swansea had been traduced. Swansea is a wonderful place, the mumbles, great, fantastic. Anglesey is the, you know, the pits, you don't want to go there, and people in ringing in, no, Anglesey is wonderful, and, and so on. I was hardly able to get a word in on this, but <laughs> when I did get a word in, I said it's probably something to do with the makeup of the population. Anglesey has a heck of a lot of retired people who are generally fairly happy, and Swansea has a much more mixed population. So I think once you, you start playing around with these, these figures uh, w without really understanding what they're picking up, it can lead you into, into all sorts of silliness. And so I'm not entirely convinced, and I hope the panel and the discussion will convince me, <coughs> that well-being indices are worth talking about, uh, uh, subjective well-being indices, and that they do lead to some kind of policy uh, you know, proposals. At the moment, I don't see that. Len, thank you. Could you take up one thing that you've uh, opened up for us? You've been quite critical about the role of government in promoting policies or, or things that are in support of well-being, broadly speaking. But say something, if you would, about governance and the rule we're thinking internationally here of rule of law, property rights, uh, government uh, that is transparent and accountable. Could you take on that kind of larger ball of wax? Uh, well, I think uh, things like pro uh, property rights are, are clearly very important, and they're a component of things like the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom Index, and they've been shown to be uh, very important for economic and, and indeed uh, economic development and wider measures of, of uh, prosperity. Governance is an interesting issue. Um, I think it was touched on in the presentation that one of the indicators you have is, is uh, I, I can't remember the precise wording, but uh, you know, people's attitude to the government. And I, I think it's very interesting that your top country, uh, five years running, is Norway, where they've just kicked out the government after, after a two-term thing. The Labour government has been kicked out, presumably because the people are not altogether happy with being at the top of this particular mountain. So, I mean, the question of how governance feeds into people's uh, perception of well-being, I don't know. I think in many countries, uh, you know, people would be very happy 
never to see the government, uh, you know, because the government is intrusive on their lives, it brings trouble, it brings repression, and so on. So whether government is, is, is always uh, part of the solution, or whether it's the problem or not, I think uh, remains to be discussed. Thank you. Brendan, you want to start from there or continue from there? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, and um, yeah, thanks to the other speakers that have um, been useful in, in um, training our thoughts on this. I think I would, with Len's point, I think it's for the very reasons for all the, the ways in which these figures can be misused and uh, that we need to think very carefully. And that's where having conceptual clarity is so important. I think the thing that we want is, of course, there are these... Um, in indices of how happy people felt yesterday, interesting as they are and can be used in all sorts of interesting ways, for these sorts of purposes can be ludicrous and, and bring the whole of this politics of well-being into disrepute. What we want to do, I think, is give people capabilities to run good lives. And the idea that governments are powerless to do this, I, I would reject that very strongly. I think when we look at what hap what's happened in those countries that have been at the top of this index for year in, year out, Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Canada and so on, what we've seen there is systems not only of government but other national institutions such as employers' organisations and trade unions and so on in a role of social partnership and in a productive way being able to think what sort of society do we want we want a healthy society, we want a society uh, where we have good education systems, where we have low unemployment and so on. And by being clearly focused on those in a cooperative way, have been able to get those countries to the top of the list in a way that other countries clearly haven't been able to succeed. <coughs> so I think we can, we can see that there are very clearly some sorts of situations where social partners in societies come together that do create the outcomes. <coughs> sure, I'm sure in Denmark they're not happy with the government all the time, and that's very healthy. It's a health sign of a, of a good governmental system, a good opposition party, and so on. So we're not going to make people say they're happy with government, but we are going to get governments that can give us the sorts of outcomes that we want, like increasing life expectancy, better education levels, and so on. And I think I just... Because it, it, something Jules said that I thought was so important and um, we shouldn't lose is, of course, there is that time dimension. And there are things that we can do now that would maybe make us a bit happier now, but could lead to really atrocious falls <coughs> in quality of life over the coming decades. And the environment is so important in that way. If we're not concerned about climate change, it would be very easy to forget about it now. It would solve our uh, current problem of fuel prices, maybe. If we're not concerned about that now, we'll bring such unhappiness in the long term and it is going to be taking countries like Bangladesh and India right back even more so than our developed countries so if there's a way and I don't know what that is but if you do this sort of work if you can incorporate the long term as well as the short term into that that would be I think something that we is, is absolutely essential to focus on. Thank you. Jules, um, now we have lots to talk about. Two things on my mind. First of all this uh, issue, and I think you started it, uh, if I may say, uh, government, um, what role and for what? Uh, for us as individuals, uh, our responsibility for what? That's the one thing. And the second uh, thing, very much related to that, if we're thinking globally here, what about in all of this the role of culture? And by that, I'm, I, I could mean history and uh, religion and uh, tradition. But uh, one could also uh, more, uh, what on a macro level, be talking about in any society, habits and values and behaviors. How much do those things shape conversation about well-being? Mm -hmm. um, so um, the first one about the balance between what governments can do and what individuals can do. Um, I think it's interesting to look at the area of mental health through that perspective. Um, so, which is something I, I look about and write about a lot. Um, so, in mental health, a lot of, you know, try get building a more flourishing or happy life is uh, unfortunately down to us. Uh, you know, we're the, ultimately the people 
who get who can change our own beliefs and to change our habits. Whether you know if we're alcoholic or uh, depressed or so, there's, there's certain things that we have to kind of do. I think um, for ourselves. But what government can do is um, help to kind of teach us in a way some basic techniques that we can use um, to learn to take care of ourselves through things like um, talking therapy, for example. So I think there's a kind of balance between governments um, providing some lessons or useful kind of wisdom in a non-coercive way, which individuals then you know, can use or not as, as, as they see fit. On a point, sorry to interrupt, mm. but on a point like that, you know, apart from government, what about civil society? What about civic institutions? What about community organizations, right. and churches, and so forth? Well, I think they can do um, a huge amount. Yeah, I mean, I think, and one of the things I'm interested in in mental health policy is how the NHS can link together with community groups. So, if you go and see a therapist on the NHS, you don't just have a ten-week course and that's it. You're, you know, you come out at the end of it and you're still on your own. Well, let's say if you do courses within prisons, I started doing like uh, philosophy courses in prisons, and you can try and help prisoners while they're in there, but then they leave the prison and they're back, you know, isolated, atomized, and lonely. So that's something where, you know, community groups play, play a huge role in giving people this feeling of belonging, of being listened to, uh, of, you know, being taken, uh, you know, having some importance for their, for their community. Um, so, and I think a lot of well-being studies find that um, religion, to, to take your point, is, is, is good for people's well-being, partly because it gives them this feeling of belonging to, to these groups, to, you know, uh, religions tend to be very good at community organisation, and also it gives them just a, a sense that their lives have transcendent meaning, never mind how much they're earning or whether they're unemployed or something. Um, so, uh, but, I, but, but you rarely see well-being economists, uh, you know, Arguing for, for 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 more religion in our in our societies, there actually there's a, one of the most famous well-being economists is this uh, Richard Layard. I don't know if anyone's heard of him, Lord Richard Layard, and he's he's actually trying to launch his own new uh, kind of religion uh, called Action for Happiness, which is uh, you know trying to kind of teach people how to be um, happier in this new kind of utilitarian religion of happiness. Um, but your point about culture, I think, is a really interesting um, one. I mean, I guess you were hinting at the, the, the role of culture in teaching us habits. Again, that's something that um, religious culture uh, did quite well. Um, but there's a very, I mean, I think we learn a great deal about our well-being from our culture, but we've left our culture pretty much entirely to the private sector to just say, so, you know, it's a difficult question whether we should try to control our culture so that Miley Cyrus isn't on our children's TV or something. I mean, then you get into questions of, of censorship and government mm. intervention. Um, and just one last point on the importance of culture. I think culture is massively, massively important in different definitions of flourishing. This is why I think there's, there's some risk of these kind of international comparisons of well-being, you know, Costa Rica's up and Denmark's down, because these, these different cultures might have very different ideas of, of what it means to flourish. So it's a bold claim to kind of say that we can apply one definition of flourishing right across the board, universally. Um, which is, I mean, so I'm quite interested, for example, in the approach of the philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who, who developed this capabilities approach, <coughs> which is try to get governments to protect certain basic capabilities like security, health, and education, and then leave people you know, free to define their own definition of flourishing from those basic capabilities. I think that respects cultural difference. Jules, thank you. And uh, gentlemen here on the stage, uh, with that, we're going to turn to the audience. We have distinguished colleagues with us today and uh, considerable expertise here in the room. My colleague Jordan has a microphone. If you'd raise your hand and identify yourself and who would like to be first. Then I'll ask. I think I can't quite see, but I think sitting behind Jordan is our colleague, the ambassador from Slovakia. Yeah. Yes. So would you? I'm picking on you, but um, you're probably doing your emails on your BlackBerry. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Uh, J Jordan's gonna uh, give you the microphone, and you saw in this year's index um, from our research, good news for Slovakia, and and so we hope you're happy with that. Now you can tell us whether it's accurate. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy with some of it. 
not with all of it, actually, because that would be my question. How did you do the, uh, your index of uh, personal freedom? Because at that index, Slovakia didn't perform that well. I was, I was a bit surprised. Uh, in, in general, in economic terms, we performed quite well. But in this particular index, we <coughs> were behind all our neighbors. And I was, I was a bit surprised. I, I, I would like to know how did you get this? Uh, I, I, I rather wanted to talk it in private, but I, when you <laughs> asked <laughs> me, here we are at the Gotten Institute, a public policy organization, <laughs> and we dive right in. Ambassador, yeah. thank no, you. No, I, 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 I would like to ask about the methodology and how did you get the data for it? Because once again, there's, there's this uh, significant problem between expectations, uh, what people feel about certain <coughs> issues, and what are the, what are the possibility for uh, real measurement of mm. these kind of things, like personal, uh, personal freedom. Thank you. With, um, and Nathan, I'm going to call on you to join me, if you, if you would, and stand up and, and take on the methodological question, because you know best under the hood. Uh, I do want to say, without any trace of defensiveness at all, trust me, that this is a social science, right? This is not a natural science. This is a social science. And we do have these eight sub-indices, and we have 89 variables, and we have data from a range of organizations, as Nathan said at the top of the program, the World Bank and the World Health Organization and Freedom House and others. A and uh, it's a, uh, uh, a crunching of a range of uh, sources to come up with these things, which we think are decently representative and accurate. Uh, and there may be qualifications here or there. But could you say something, uh, Nathan, a little bit about the personal freedom scores and how we accumulate and how we assess that? Yeah, of course. Um, I might already be mic'd up. I think you're mic'd, um, yeah. So I would just point you to pages 53 and 53. Nathan, do me a favor and stand over here, center stage. You'll block me, but that's OK, right in mm -hmm. front of that camera. <laughs> uh, pages 53 and 54 of the brochure in which we mm. outline um, the kind of uh, broad methodology of, um, of the Prosperity Index. Um, if you're really interested, I can find you the sort of 200-page version of that, which goes into all the calculations and everything as well. Um, uh, but um, essentially, within personal freedom, we look at um, a number of different factors. Um, so on the, on the subjective side, as soon as we're talking about that, we look at um, perceptions of things like personal freedom. So uh, the survey question um, relates to whether or not citizens feel that they have a degree of personal freedom uh, within the course of their lives. Uh, with their, their lives. Uh, and we also look at um, tolerance towards immigrants and also ethnic minorities as well within that. Again, that's um, a self-reported um, uh, metric as well. Um, and then there's uh, measures um, uh, on the kind of the, the hard data side. We use measures of civil liberties and free choice, which comes from, come from organizations um, like the World Bank, like Freedom House, for example. And those uh, are kind of some of the measures which come together to, to produce the overall ranking on that. Nathan, thank you. And this gentleman all the way back in the corner, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, my name's Ewan Grant. I'm um, now a um, risk consultant. I was previously the intelligence analyst in the UK Customs Service for transnational organized crime and <coughs> quite coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, the former Soviet countries. Um, my question perhaps follows on from the ambassador's point, although in a different angle regarding the methodology about governance. Um, I would just wonder, was sufficient weight given to um, business corruption as an influence on government, government itself? I notice business and government corruption is a factor <coughs> in the governance issue, but it's one of many. And the reasons I would perhaps query some of the rankings is you, re you rate Switzerland as highest on governance, and um, I notice also Luxembourg scores very highly as well. Well, both those countries have enormous banking sectors in relation to their GDP, and um, I'm being quite serious here. This isn't a facetious point. I would draw the audience's attention to the 
1970s and 1980s novels by the Canadian banker Paul Erdman, now dead, several of them were filmed, <coughs> where um, <coughs> he has a personal grouse against the Swiss. I mean, the theme of all his books is his hatred of the Swiss. But I can't help wonder, um, we've seen the tax evasion or tax planning and so on, We've seen the remarks made about Luxembourg in uh, the first Alex Dryden book. And I, I wonder if we're, we're looking a bit too much at law and regulation in evaluating governance in the developed countries and mm. not enough um, to certain other issues. I've worked with Slovaks. Um, I've worked with people from northern European countries and I can assure you the worst case of um, corruption I saw by a colleague was by somebody from a Nordic country by a long way. Thank you. Um, as that is another question to methodology, Nathan, I'm going to ask you to come over here and take that chair and as it may not be the last Hang on and stay up here with us. So if you could take that briefly, because I want to get our other panelists involved, and uh, some of these things will be taken up in the coffee break. But nevertheless, important question about governance, the developing, developed world in developing countries like Switzerland and Luxembourg. Mm. Um, I'll leave aside the point about um, <coughs> 80s literature um, for now and um, <laughs> focus just on the methodology. Um, a very funny book. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, within the governance sub-index, again, just refer to page 53, um, there are um, you know, some sort of 15 individual uh, indicators which go in to make this overall measure of, of, of governance. Um, and that does include uh, governance of, uh, within business and also government. And that's actually a combined variable that we use. We don't uh, separate the two out. They're combined, so it's an aggregate business and government um, corruption. Let, let it be noted to the audience that the gentleman who asked the question put a thumbs up in the back. <laughs> so, so far, maybe so good. <coughs> to a point on weightings, um, again, that 200-page um, methodology document uh, which exists um, goes into the details of the specific weightings for the individual <coughs> indicators. But across the eight subcategories, we don't provide, uh, we don't weight any of the subcategories. Um, they're all equally weighted. Um, but what we do allow for on our website is for um, users to go on and actually weight the different subcategories. Um, so, for example, uh, when I'm presenting to a room full of economists, they would say, well, the economy sub-index is far more important than the other seven. It should be more heavily weighted. And uh, so on the website, you can go on, you can add double or triple weighting to the economy sub-index, and then you can see how the rankings would change if, for example, that category is more heavily weighted. So that gets into a little bit of, of that, I hope. Nathan, thank you. We're going to take additional questions. I feel warmly invited to pepper Nathan with the hardest of questions about methodology. However, do not <laughs> neglect our other panelists yeah. here who may want to weigh in on methodology, but also broader issues of policy. Yes, straight back with your hand up. Last row. Thank you. Hi. Um, so my name is Ruth Schreiber. I'm a consultant at Cubic Consulting. Um, I'm, one of the things that I'm really curious about with regards to the whole um, methodology <coughs> and beyond methodology is that surely at some point there will always become an impasse. Um, Jules, you talked about the capability approach. And one of the main things about the capability approach that Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen created was that at some point people will become so educated that they'll be aware of their own downfall, i.e. a... They give a wonderful example of an Indian woman living in Mumbai. You know, you ask her how she is, she goes, I'm poor, my children are poor, my slaves are poor, everyone's poor. And yet you ask someone living on the rural area of India, they'll say, I'm fine, you know, the sun is shining, I'm okay today. And there is this element that where you have more education and where you have people who are aware of their, where the country's going, where they're in more rural mm. uh, urban areas, they will always reach a point where they'll become so much more aware of where they could be. Countries like the Nordics, where they're so aware of where they should be, the UK, the US, we become very cynical with what our potential is. Um, what would you say to that and kind of that impasse and how to move beyond that? George, would you take that first? I'll get yeah, the other colleagues involved. Sure. I mean, we, were, we were talking about this a bit yeah. before, weren't we? About um, am I, do, do I have an assumption that education will uh, enhance uh, our life and, and, and make us um, happier when perhaps there's an argument that, that ignorance is bliss sometimes, which I think is 
maybe Nussbaum's uh, kind of getting at there. <coughs> and I mean, I, it's possible that I am laboring under what Bernard Williams might have called the Socratic fallacy, the idea that self-knowledge will make you happier, will improve your life. Uh, and, and, and maybe it won't. I mean, I, 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 I think every kind of philosophy involves an element of faith. So I'm, I can't really be sure. I'm just going on that working assumption that education does <coughs> kind of, I don't know if it necessarily improves your hedonic levels of day-to-day -day habit, but I'm hoping and I think that it improves uh, people's sense of um, kind of meaningfulness. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going on that assumption. If, uh, if evidence comes to the contrary, then I'll just, you know, I can quit my job and, uh, <laughs> go and watch TV. Bre Brendan, could you jump in on this and also say something that comes to my mind about the role in any given society of, um, of what? Um, comparison, um, maybe even also envy. You know, I remember after the fall of the Berlin Wall, five years later, when you asked in Central Europe, uh, for example, of Poles, how are you doing? They compared to the past and they said, pretty well. When you ask East Germans the same question, they said not so well. They were comparing themselves to West Germany, where it was a, a standard that was simply uh, hard to match and unrealistic. So take on the question generally, but then also, you know, how do we as individuals and societies judge our lot by comparing to our neighbor, another country, the past? Again, I think it, um, it, it's a very good question, and it, and it does point out the problems here as we change people's with education, we bring higher expectations, and then it's sometimes very difficult to fulfill those, particularly in times of economic crisis. We're now producing a lot of well-educated people in many Western European countries, and there aren't those jobs for them. So whether we've actually given them unfulfilled uh, promises and we can't fulfill those promises, and we've actually made them unhappier through education, that, that, that's certainly true. And cynically, governments can easily make people happy by varying their expectations, varying who, they, who they're making these comparisons with. Um, the easy way to make people more satisfied with their jobs is to lower their expectations about what, what a, job, a good job should be. So that, again, that's why I think we, if we don't con uh, concentrate <coughs> so much on those comparisons, and when you ask people how satisfied they are, that's one of the things you're asking them to compare, whether they're comparing their current job with what they think jobs ought to be like, for instance, or comparing with the jobs they've had in the past, sim similar for lives. So if we, I think, therefore, we're on more solid ground, much more solid ground, if we look at, say, what education does to, say, family well-being. And we can see absolutely clear as anything when women's education, particularly more so women than men, when women's education improves, child mortality decreases, and also their expectations around family size. Again, that's maybe one of those other big things in the long term we ought to think about is population growth. Again, very strong relationship to education. So I think education brings about all sorts of improvements in societies, but doesn't necessarily make us happier or more satisfied in the short term. Thank you. Lynn, can we hear you on uh, this question of the better off we are the higher, the greater the expectations, and, and arguably the less, either less satisfying or perhaps the more demanding we are? Well, uh, when we talk about these subjective indicators of well-being, there, there are clearly problems with them. They're, they have an upper limit, for example. I mean, I mean unlike GDP or something, which can grow <laughs> forever. Um, you, you can't grow, you know, these well-being measures, are, are you know, like the, like the ONS one I mentioned, is rated on a 10-point scale. Well, if everybody's up at nine already <laughs> or something, you're not, you're not going to go through the roof on that. Um, so I think there are difficulties with that. If I come back to this, this education thing, I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't think education necessarily improves these subjective measures. But there are fairly objective measures, and you've mentioned in relation to poor, poor economies that you know infant mortality falls and so on. But even within uh, developed economies, there there are things like stability of relationships, which tend to be associated with uh, uh, you know access to higher education, uh, fitness, health, those kind of issues, health status. Um, I, you know, I've I've actually a, a bit of a, a you know, from the point of view of an economist teaching universities and so on, you know, oh yeah, education is wonderful, come and get a degree. Well, actually, um, it probably doesn't do a huge amount uh, for a country's rate of growth because it 
you know, a lot of it is positional. You're getting people into jobs which would have been done by A-level people 30 years ago, that kind of thing. But it does seem to affect people's <coughs> attitudes over time to the way in which they, uh, they run their lives. And if this is manifested in things like uh, better health status, uh, less smoking, less, you know, less drinking, things like this, then that's probably... Uh, quite a good thing, I guess. I just, yeah. I just want to make a quick um, point on that. Um, I think there was, there was a very interesting book that came out, I think, at the end of the last year, um, called by the economist Tyler Cowen, um, called The Great Stagnation. Mm. And one of the things it was looking at was our economies are likely just to, you know, grow at a much slower rate for for a good few years. Um, I think the, the kind of the, the the problem we're talking about is like we're talking about uh, education is just to get jobs uh, and then it raises your expectations that you will get a job and then maybe there isn't a job for you. I think then education is geared to the wrong goal and to the wrong, you know, where our society is going to be for a, for a good few years. So we need to try and, and, and create the idea that education isn't just to get a job and that your status isn't just linked to your job and your earnings, that education is, is for, you know, the benefits of just uh, growing, you know, expanding your mind uh, of, of, of the pleasure of knowledge, and that's something that you can carry with you. So we want to try and get people, teach them to be lifelong learners, teach them to enjoy it for the sake of it and carry on doing it for the rest of their life. Because Cowan ends his book by saying, even though our economies and our societies, well, even though our economies might be stagnating, there's still many ways we can get satisfaction and meaning from our lives, which don't involve money so much. We still, we've got the internet, which you know, is a way that many people can participate, learn, and create for free. It's not necessarily adding to our GDP, but it's giving us a sense of meaning and participation. Thank you. Um, this gentleman here in the middle, we'll get you all in, almost all of you, but this gentleman here. Um, thank you. My name is David Braham. Um, the one thing I noticed, on, was it page 53, 54, that wasn't there is transparency versus privacy. Um, we know more things now than we did 20 years ago, but some say we're happier, other people say we're, we're miserable because we're not earning as much as the CEO down the road is. Should it be in there? And how would you rate it? And, and, and what advantage would it be to and not to have it in there? Nathan? Uh, just to clarify, we're talking privacy in terms of um, spying people's on emails and no, that kind of thing. privacy of what they should and shouldn't know, access to media and what's in the media and things like that. Okay. Um, well, I think... Um, Access to, uh, to the media and to uh, information is, uh, is in probably in some part wrapped up in the um, Entrepreneurship and Opportunity Sub-Index, perhaps surprisingly, because we look at things like the degree to which a country has connectivity to the internet and to uh, kind of systems for, uh, for knowledge. But, um, so it, a little bit, I think, it's captured in that. But I mean, I guess the, the simple answer to that is, is specifically we don't include a measure um, or a privacy of that nature within the index. Next question, please. Uh, MacDonald Radcliffe. Here are the most relevant identities of uh, the King Abdullah Dialogue Centre in Vienna. I'm very struck, first of all, by the fact that c collectively we all have a very high happiness quotient with regard to the, the, the prosperity index. And secondly, perhaps as Nathan would himself predict, it seems that as it gets older, our contentment with it also increases, which is very nice. But our sp individual speakers, when they look at the detailed components that make up the index, have raised a lot of specific points that would suggest they had individual concerns. I just wondered if we might comment a little bit about that paradox, first of all, between the overall contentment with the index <coughs> and our very specific and quite hard-nosed questions about the specifics that make it up. Hmm. The second would be to ask the question of, well, is this the ultimate triumph of a consequentialist con uh, um, kind of uh, reasoning um, where the happiness of the greatest number defines the good? It seems quite clear from the comments on Yudai Minier that actually you cannot separate the concept of the good from some sense of <coughs> teleology, which is, of course, exactly what most religious <coughs> traditions would have articulated. So I just wondered if we could reflect on that point. Is it possible to separate what is going to give us a sense of fulfillment and happiness in the full sense of eudaimonia without reference to that which we are called to be as human beings, which therefore means there has to be, by definition, an overarching concept of what it is to be fully human, which can be instantiated to a more or a lesser degree. And then, just on specifics, I hesitate to try uh, Nathan yet further, but I remember from past experience with having produced or been involved with production of an index with the World Economic Forum that we had two experiences that are relevant about subjective aspects in particular. One, there was a survey done which asked people about openness. And one, the country that came out top in the initial survey was Saudi Arabia. Apparently, the people of Saudi Arabia considered themselves the most open in the world. 
this, to many people, and I'm not in any way questioning that, <laughs> uh, was a surprise. <coughs> now, was, it emerged that a lot of Saudi Arabians would like to meet more people from overseas, but hadn't apparently very much done so, or something like that. There was an explanation produced, but it pointed to a certain difficulty when you asked objective questions about openness. Thirdly, very briefly, specifically with regard to Gallup, which again was a very fine company with which we worked very successfully. An issue that popped up with the global survey is that it's sequential. They don't ask all these countries at the same time. So you begin in one set of countries in January and you progress through the year going around the world. If you have a cataclysmic or enormously influential event, let's take 9-11, in the middle of the year, the attitudes and perceptions will have shifted in just about all those countries vastly. So are you left with an apples and pear question about the results? There's lots there. <laughs> At the top of that question, <laughs> um, Len, maybe you first, because I think you, you are perhaps the lead, um, I want to say instigator, I won't say instigator, but, but certainly on this panel today, a, a um, uh, what, a lively uh, critic, maybe that's too strong a word, of the index, or at least its premise, and how important is this area of research and what is its relevance for public policy? Maybe you could start with that part. Uh, I think the uh, uh, index is like this. And, and uh, I said at the beginning, it's, it's one of several that are around. And I think it's actually better than, than some of the other ones. Um, they, they are of interest. I think it's when people start trying to pick out of them uh, some sort of causal relationships in a very naive way. Uh, and then try to draw policy conclusions. But that's, that's my problem with a lot of this. Um, I, I, as far as uh, you know, the issue of, of particular uh, indicators not being too good, um, I, yeah, we could, we could spend weeks and weeks picking through this. But I, I feel there's a kind of law of large numbers kind of thing here. You've got so many indicators here uh, that you're probably getting. I mean, nobody is seriously going to disagree that countries like Norway and Switzerland and you know this lot are going to top any kind of league, any set of indicators you you, you want to do, and there's going to be countries at the bottom like Chad and you know uh, who for the time being are really in a, a desperate state. Um, I've got no problem with that, but it's when people start you know their brows thorough because uh, you know the UK slipped from 13th to 16th place. My goodness, you know what are we doing wrong? Uh, you, you've got to think that that's a little bit stupid. <laughs> Nathan, is it fair to say, broadly speaking, uh, because Norway came up again, that um, there are certain things that at least are often helpful? For example, and correct me where I'm wrong, that small can be an advantage, that uh, homogeneous can be an advantage, Surrounded by peaceful neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, high levels of internal safety and security. Could you tell us, just broadly speaking, about some of those things that, that they may be intuitive, but that are worth mentioning? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, the list. Um, that's absolutely right. Small countries tend to do better on the index. Likewise, um, countries that have strong, established democratic governments, you know, that, that don't see. Um, regime changes very often um, tend mm. to do very well. And I mentioned in the presentation as well that um, countries um, that have an established uh, entrepreneurial uh, structure that encourage entrepreneurship, where citizens are, uh, have the opportunity to learn, to grow in society, also do very well um, in the index. I, I was hoping to pick up a point about, um, uh, about the uh, subjective data and how sometimes it can be um, misleading. And I think, um, uh, actually, we need to sometimes um, uh, realize the limits of data. Um, and this speaks very nicely to why in the Prosperity Index we use the subjective data, but we put it alongside the objective data as well. <coughs> um, and we found over the years that there are a number of countries where, um, for example, levels of freedom and governance might be quite low, but yet when you look at the subjective data, um, it reports very high levels of satisfaction with the government and with levels of freedom, which is actually pretty <coughs> obvious. If someone with a clipboard that you don't know comes to your house and starts asking you questions about the government, you're probably going to answer favorably. And so, um, and, and so actually, it's, it's, it's quite helpful to put those two bits of data together and sometimes interpret the gap <coughs> between them, um, even when they don't um, quite match up. Mm, so uh, yeah. this is <coughs> one reason why we actually use both types of data in the index to hopefully paint a slightly broader picture. On that question, uh, uh, an observation uh, from my part on methodology, and then a question to Brendan and 
Jules Gimnot culture. The observation is, uh, before I joined the Legatum Institute, I was president of something called Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, which is a US congressionally funded organization that does television and social media and radio and so forth for countries that don't have free and independent media. Did that during the Cold War, still does it today. And just to put a point on it, it's an obvious one, but probably worth mentioning, uh, we had a Persian service, and you know, like BBC and others, we were not allowed to have a bureau in Tehran. Okay? We had a Persian service that broadcast from outside the country with a network of reporters in, um, informally inside Iran, but also in places like Yerevan, and Istanbul, and Baku, and, and Dubai. And uh, we, like any media company, needed to do polling to find out what people thought about the quality of our programming and the relevance of our, our shows. So what did we do? You know, we did what one does. We would call people at home in Shiraz or Tehran on a Friday night through a uh, group outsourced in Istanbul uh, with Persian native speakers and ask them. And of course, if you pick up the phone in one of those Iranian cities, you do wonder who's calling and who's listening before you answer. And uh, you know, we did focus groups in places like Istanbul, where Iranians come out uh, freely, more or less freely, students and business people. We did polling groups, but one always had to be aware that it wasn't just legitimate business people and students in those polling groups. The intelligence services sat in those polling groups, too. So the first comment is generally about methodology and our index, that there are countries that are not free, Saudi Arabia being one, where indeed security forces and intelligence operatives infiltrate and uh, shape opinion and skew data. The question about culture, um, back to that, in any number of these countries, how much does culture play a role and could we drill a little bit deeper? You know, again, I suppose an obvious observation, but you know, if you go around the world, Britain, the United States, but then let's say Botswana, Costa Rica, Taiwan, and you ask the simplest of questions like, who are you? Mm -hmm. In one cultural context, a person might be apt to say, who am I? Um, American, engineer, MIT graduate, uh, smoker, uh, and so on. In another cultural setting, one might take the same question and say, who am I? Father, brother, um, citizen or member of a community or a tribe and so forth. So Jules, you first. In taking on this big issue of well-being, uh, again, you go where, go where you will. But how much does culture matter? Because it seems to me, in some instances, it could actually matter a lot. Yeah, I, I, I think it uh, does. And I think you made a good point there about thinking about it in individual terms of your own life and, and maybe your own career versus more collective uh, attitudes towards well-being. And there are academics who've looked at that and discovered that, you know, as, as you'd expect, that um, Asian communities, for example, have much more collective ideas and definitions of well-being, whilst we have more individual ideas in Western and particularly in Anglo-Saxon societies. So um, yeah, I think it, it, it plays a, a, a big difference. It, it makes a big difference. Um, can I go back to a point that was please, made um, um, by, by the Reverend um, about teleology? You got into some quite interesting areas <clears throat> there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, as far as I'm aware, there, there are kind of two main ways that people, <clears throat> philosophical ways that people have tried to define and measure national well-being. There's the utilitarian measurement of, of our happiness levels. And then people have tried to, to kind of find a more Aristotelian measurement, uh, measuring our, our, our eudaimonia or, or flourishing, which is based, as you say, on some kind of idea of an essential human nature that we have and we all share, and the kind of which you can fulfill. But as far as I'm aware, the economists tend to do that. They, well, I've rarely seen God mentioned in those discussions. So they have a, an idea of, of an essential human nature, but unlike Aristotle, they don't tie it to something extra human. You know, so that's an interesting philosophical question, whether you can have a kind of an idea of flourishing rooted in human nature without God, because I suppose there are many different ways you could define human nature uh, and, and, and what makes it fulfilled. Um, and my, my kind of wariness, though, though I'm probably more Aristotelian than utilitarian, I'm still not sure whether you can measure flourishing and, 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 and put a number on it. I know that some psychologists and economists have tried to do that. There's a famous psychologist called Martin Seligman who developed positive psychology. And he thinks you can measure the meaningfulness 
of a person's life, for example, and give it a score from 1 to 10, and measure how much they've achieved in their life and give it a score from 1 to 10. I don't see how. I think you can ask someone how meaningful do you think their life is, but they might be wrong according to where you're standing. You can measure the flow to what extent they're engaged in an activity. But someone on amphetamines playing Xbox is very engaged in that activity. It doesn't mean that it's a worthwhile activity. So I'm not sure. I mean, and actually, you're, uh, you're the, the, the first uh, reverend I've met who's kind of au fait with these um, well-being measurements. So I, I, I'd be interested to know, do you think that you can measure, uh, objectively measure someone's flourishing? Labels has been expended, it would be rash of me to leap in here, but um, I think actually it's highly problematic, very problematic, because any attempt to do that, and there's an obviously a long answer and long discussion to be had, but the short answer is I think it's very difficult to do in any quantificational way. Mm. That doesn't mean to say that trying to collect such data as you may cannot be helpful, which is what we're doing here. So I'm in favour of the index, but I have some very large fundamental questions about the overall project at another level which is not a criticism of the index as such, I should stress, but I do think it's very useful. And in fact, at the Kai Seed Center, we're very interested in using some of it. So. But I, I think they're large questions, one for a longer discussion, I think, which mm. we might pursue another time. But short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Brendan. Let me, let me come back on Good this question. cultural issue. And it certainly is. A, a <laughs> survey <coughs> researchers know very well that the way in which people answer questions in different countries, coming from different cultures, with different levels of pessimism and optimism, for instance, it's very hugely. My Bulgarian friends, for instance, tell me if someone asks you in the street, how are you today, you've got to tell them at least five bad things before you say one good thing. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll think you're boasting. Um, whereas in, in England, you know, classically, no matter how badly your life's going, when you meet an acquaintance in the street and they say, how are you, you say, fine. We can overcome these things, and it's being clever about it and, and doing these sorts of uh, surveys yeah. and thinking about, for instance, one of the great things we've got here is not a snapshot at one point in time, but we're asking these questions year in, year out in different countries. So when we see that one country is above another country in terms of some of these things, yes, you might be healthily sceptical about that. But when you see some countries are clearly on an upward trajectory and others are a downward trajectory, now we've got this five years data set, you can, you're on much firmer ground. So yeah, you need to think carefully. I think most of these things, if you think about it carefully and you're, you're, you make these conceptual distinctions, <clears throat> you can get a lot out of this data, but you can't ever treat it like it's some, you know, come out of some physics laboratory and it's unproblematic. It's, it's a social science. The, and you can draw different conclusions from this. When the UNDP launched or had launched through them, and it, it was done in a quasi-independent way because they knew it was going to be so controversial, when the Human Development Index first came out, they knew it was going to be criticised. It was a very vulgar thing to do. There were all sorts of problems with it. They went to what had published and been damned. They were, and I think it's it's just caused revolutionised the way we think about development. And if it wasn't for these sorts of things, I mean, we've seen there are these uh, the small differences. We see huge difference. We see the sub-Saharan Africa massive advances in in health. That's that's come out so clearly. And yet, even recently in the House of Commons, our MPs were telling us, some of them, that we were throwing money at sub-Saharan Africa and nothing was changing there. Clearly it is. There are sometimes you just having that sort of data is so important it compared to sitting around uh, uh, speculating about it. There are other organisations, and one of my recent publications, I was comparing the UNDP and Human Development Index with the ILO, the International Labour Organisation, They've been thinking strongly about the concept of decent work, how people are treated at work, um, good jobs and bad <coughs> jobs and, and employment systems. They were going down route towards measuring it and publishing these sorts of league tables. They realised whatever they did would be controversial. They had uh, criticism from employers' organisations, in some cases trade unions and other organisations, <coughs> and they fought shy, and they decided they weren't going to publish this sort of league table. And I think that's meant we've got a stagnation going forwards in that area. I think you've got to get these things out there. Do as well as you can, get them out there, and leave it up to other people to come back with criticisms which can be incorporated so these things are improved. Apropos of that, two quick stories, probably both apocryphal and <laughs> apropos, as I said. First of all, the story of the student who asked Milton Friedman uh, decades ago when Friedman was alive, the great Chicago economist, Professor Friedman, what do we do about those things we cannot measure? 
And Milton Friedman said, measure them anyway. <laughs> and then Friedrich Hayek, the great Austrian economist, asked exactly the same question. Professor Hayek, what do we do about those things that we can't measure? Hayek is reported to have said, be very, very humble. Uh, thank you, all of you in the audience. Uh, wonderful questions, great round of discussion. We're going to break for 30 minutes sharp, reconvening here at 345. I can tell you that the coffee break is either upstairs one floor in the library or all the way down in the Legatum Institute Cafe. But before you take leave for the coffee break, I think we've had a fabulous panel, great expertise, terrific discussion. Join me in thanking them.